Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Hillside Community Church of 100 Mile and our online broadcast for Sunday, April 11th, 2021. Well, we had a wonderful weekend last weekend. We had a Resurrection Day celebration to beat all. I, it was great, uh, just uh, that it was a drive-in service, and that was not exactly what we wanted because it would have been nice to be together in person, but we did see each other through our windows, and we were able to worship the Lord together. There's just such a wonderful feeling of camaraderie and unity that took place on that service. And I'm, I'm just grateful for all the people that helped put that together. We're gonna to be doing more drive-in services as the, uh, the season progresses here. It's a little cold right now. We were a little bit nippy last Sunday, so we're not gonna be doing drive-in services again until the first week of May, Lord willing. So we have a stage that we've rented and we're gonna be having that in the field. And we're gonna be holding our services in May in a little bit later time frame, we're gonna be starting them at 11 o'clock rather than at 10 o'clock, just because of the, the temperatures early in the morning. Well, that being said, I'm just glad that you could join me. For those who are from out of the area that are joining our broadcast here this morning, welcome. We're just glad you could be with us today. Would you bow with me in a word of prayer as we open today's uh, message? Dear, dear Jesus, we thank you for your faithfulness, Lord, and I thank you for the believers that are out there listening to this, this message and this broadcast. Father, I just pray that you would, you would speak through me by the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, that people would be encouraged, that they would be strengthened in their walk with you. And today, God, as we launch a new series, Father, we pray your blessing upon it, that, uh, Father, that uh, you would just minister in power and that your Holy Spirit would fill each one of us, Lord, as we listen to this message. We praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So, um, I've been praying and thinking about where we're going next. Now, for those of you who have been following our broadcasts, I, I just finished a series in the book of Second Peter. Now, I've been you know, weighing whether I'm going to go back into the Old Testament and preach an Old Testament series or a New Testament series. And I think I've got some clarification that we're supposed to be looking at the book of 2 Corinthians. So that's the next series that we're going to be starting into this morning, uh, 2 Corinthians. And uh, it's going to be good. I'm, I'm really excited. So let's get into it this morning. And, and if you've got a a Bible with you. Uh, we're going to be looking at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and uh, my, my sermon title this morning is Comfort in Times of Trouble, and that's the theme of the first chapter of this book. Now, I'd just like to give you a little bit of a background. Now, Paul, the apostle, uh, he introduces himself as an apostle of Jesus Christ and also introduces his young apprentice, Pastor Timothy, as a brother. And uh, so, so the setting is that Paul had established, uh, years earlier, had established this church in Corinthian, in, in Corinth, pardon me. And the Corinthian church um, had been through quite a bit. Now, uh, at the time the epistle was written to the church, uh, Corinth uh, was a great hub of activity. In the Roman Empire, and uh, you know the background to Corinth is that it is located in the modern-day country of Greece, and from its inception, uh, Corinth was a city-state, and it was believed to be occupied from about 3,000 years before Christ. That's historically what they have for archaeology there, and and historical records recovered from the area make mention of Corinth reaching back to about 800 BC. So there was a lot of things happening in this city, and um, the city was a very ungodly place. It was the, the worship place of a goddess, and it was really a moral city. And when the Romans took over, actually, in, in that region, um, there was a great war, and the men of Corinth, actually, when they were defeated, were all slaughtered. And the women and the children of the city were, were taken into slavery by the Romans, and the city was burned to the ground. So that, that city was largely uninhabited until A.D. 64, when Julius Caesar refounded the city and resettled it with people from all over the Roman Empire. Now, Corinth was rebuilt 
uh, to be uh, an economic hub in the region. And it had a large mixed population of Romans, Greeks, and quite a few Jews, actually, along with other uh, ethnicities, even the Egyptians um, had a presence there. Now, the city was affluent, it was rich, and it became a, a center for the worship of the emperor. Now, the, Julius Caesar dedicated it for, uh, for himself, and uh, there, there was an emperor worship cult there, along with other religious uh, worship uh, temples and, and, and practices from the Romans and the Greeks and, and their deities as well. So it was a diverse cultural environment and there was a Jewish presence there as well. So people were worshiping um, the God of Israel as well. Um, there was a, a cultural environment in this community that was very kind of, I guess you could say, contemporary. Because the city had been refounded so soon uh, after Paul and, 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 and Silas had founded this church there, uh, it was quite a contemporary place and, and everything was being rebuilt. So um, that's kind of the environment. Rich, affluent, trading, um, a lot of activity going on, uh, a lot of people coming to pay homage to the Caesar. Um, that's the environment that this church was planted in. So let's launch into this book, and uh, Paul says this, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God in Corinth, together with all his holy people throughout Achaia, grace and peace be to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, and um, Paul was writing uh, to a, a church that had faced a great deal of trouble, um, both from the outside, and also internal trouble as well. In his first letter to the Corinthians, Paul had to address serious issues that the people were having. And, um, you know, there was doctrinal issues. People were, weren't were acting pro properly, and, and they were actually disobeying his apost apostolic um, instructions. People were doing a lot of things that seemed right in their own eyes, so Paul sent Timothy to try and help there. And they, they, the Corinthians didn't receive Timothy all that well, and there was still some trouble. So Paul actually ended up sending a man named Titus to them to make sure the church followed the apostolic orders that were given to them. And, and through all of this, Paul earnestly desired to visit these Corinthian believers. I mean, he founded the church. He was there for roughly 18 months, I believe, when he first founded it before moving on, but, um, you know, when, when, we in, when we're introduced to this, uh, this book, you can almost feel the burden and heartache of Paul. Um, Paul had been also uh, having a difficult time. He, he'd been suffering uh, physically and emotionally, and, and so he starts out in, in verse 3, and, and here he starts to talk about the troubles that he has faced, and uh, I think he wanted to key in to the Corinthian believers because they had suffered greatly as well to the troubles that they're facing. So he says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort, comfort we ourselves receive from God. It's very interesting how Paul calls God the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. Now, he expands on this statement with a qualifier by saying, who comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comforts we ourselves receive from God. Now, in the early days of Christianity, um, a person who chose to become a Christian, and in this environment in Corinth, um, it was like this, a person who chose to become a Christian chose to embrace trouble. Now, it might come in the form of abandonment by family or possibly hostility from heathen neighbors or quite possibly the trouble could come from the government of the day. It uh, may have all been all those things combined. There's no exception um, 
of an easy go in life if you chose to be a follower of Jesus in this setting. Becoming a Christian meant being like Jesus and that meant being willing to carry a cross. 17th century Scottish theologian Samuel Rutherford once said uh, in, in a letter to one of his friends, he says this, God has called you to Christ's side and the wind is now, wind is now in Christ's face in this land. And seeing ye are with him, ye cannot expect the lee side or the sunny side of the bray. Now, that quote, you know, throughout the centuries has been a calling card almost to many churches across this globe. Now, I understand over the last hundred years, we've had it very, very good in our country. But that is not typical of many churches that have been in the world throughout the ages. And Paul understood that his audience, these Corinthians, had suffered greatly to various degrees for taking a stand for Jesus. Now, commentator William Barclay writes concerning this passage that uh, the answer to the suffering that the believers experience for following Jesus in this life can be found in the Greek word in this passage for endurance. The Greek word is huponomi, and it is the meaning of this word. It's not a bleak acceptance of trouble as far as endurance. Um, Hypnomy has a flavor of triumph in the midst of trouble. It describes the spirit that not only accepts trouble, but triumphs within it and overcomes. As silver and gold are refined in a fire and purified, um, so a Christian is made stronger and more pure by harder days. Um, as a Christian is an athlete of God in training, uh, we become stronger through life's difficulties. And that's kind of the, the flavor of this phrase that Paul starts off his, his, um, his letter to the Corinthians with. God's, God purposes to help us to grow, and he knows that we will not grow lounging on the sun decks of life. I mean, we like the sun decks of life because we like to relax and we like to be warm and we like to be fuzzy and comfy, right? But those are not the times when we really grow. Some of us expect, because we've grown so accustomed to it, that our Christian experience should be this way. And if it's not, we get all upset about it. But, um, my friends, the truth of the matter is, and Paul realized this, Athletes are made in the gym and on the field. They're not made on the sun decks of life. Now, Paul has gone through the training and he wants to encourage his fellow believers who are also going through the training to encourage them somehow in their walk through the suffering they're enduring to understand that God is with them. The Lord who understands all too well the suffering that we endure, does not expect to us to walk through the valleys of life alone. The Holy Spirit has been given, and the Bible refers to the Holy Spirit as the Comforter, the God of all comfort. Um, he also gives us one another. You see, the Holy Spirit gives us one another to encourage each other in the battles that we face. And, and Paul's you know, trying to encourage the Corinthians just as he's received comfort from the Comforter, from the Holy Spirit. He is also trying to encourage the believers who have been through so much. Um, and, and it's so much more than just the soothing sympathy. Christian comfort that God gives brings with it soothing, extraordinary courage, enabling us to cope and rise above the circumstances that have try to push us down. All that life can throw at us, there is this flavor of courage that comes along with the comfort. It's called dunamis. It's the power of the Holy Spirit, overcoming power of God. And when we feel like we've come to the end of our own ability to endure, Paul expresses here that this is a good thing. It's a good place to be in. God desires that we lean in on him 
And, and this is where we fall to our knees and we cry out to the Lord for strength. And there is much relief to be found in the sweet communion of prayer. The Apostle Paul was quite sure that God never sends his children a vision for living without giving us the power to work it out with joy. He never sends us on a task in his kingdom without giving us the power to accomplish what he has purposed. If you have a crushed spirit, be still and know that he is God. And the same thing happens today. You see, we may not have the same background, the backdrop, as the Corinthian believers did because they were facing incredibly painful trials. Nevertheless, we know that we do, we do go through trials and, and the, the fact that our entire um, routine has been shaken up and that we have been pushed to the limit based upon our own context, that is still a form of suffering. And I want you to know that if you're feeling anxious today, the God of all comfort is with you. You don't have to be anxious about anything, my friend. The Lord, he is with you. The comforter is here. If you're feeling hard pressed by the, the things that you're facing, well, the Lord wants you to know that he is with you. And I want to encourage you in that today. You can call out on him. Cast your cares upon the Lord today for he cares for you. And Paul continues in verse 5, For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, so also our comfort abounds through Christ. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces you in you patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. And our hope for you is firm, because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, you also share in our comfort. An awful lot of talk about this comfort, right? Well, Paul is serious about this. It doesn't matter whether um, it's hard times or if it's good times. You see what he said here. You know, if we're distressed, um, there's comfort. If we're doing well and, and we're comforted, then there's more comfort. And the reason Paul can say what he says in this verse is that the comforts of Christ are equal to the sufferings that one must endure for the sake of Christ. So just as the Lord Jesus Christ suffered reproach, rejection, hostility, hatred, denial, betrayal, we can expect as believers, as followers of Christ, Christians, Christ-like ones, as followers of Christ, we can expect the same thing to be happening to us. And, you know, there's another scripture that says, don't think it's strange when trials of various kinds come upon you. My friends, trials have come upon the believers from the very inception of our faith. As a matter of fact, this early church in Corinth experienced trials at a far greater uh, degree than what we face today. But it's just like, you know, if we get accustomed to kind of gliding along. You know, it can be distressing when the apple cart's ups, upside down, right? When it's overturned. We're distressed that we can't meet together uh, regularly in person. We have to look online uh, where our country is facing calamity as far as this pandemic and all that it, you know, entails with it. But, um, you know, there's been centuries before where, you know, the Christian church has faced things like the Black Plague where they're hauling people away in carts and, and people were dying like they're just dropping like flies. And, and, and then, you know, there's still places in this world today where Christians are persecuted, where there's genuine persecution. If you want to claim that you're a believer in Christ and you try to talk about him, you get taken to prison. You might even lose your life. There's, you know, like North Korea and China, terribly oppressive countries on, on the Christian faith. You know, there's other places in the world as well where people lose their lives for standing up for what's right. I understand. I'm not saying that what we're going through isn't difficult, but we need to put it into perspective. The God of all comfort will comfort us if we turn our face towards him and we cast our cares upon him. He cares for us and he's going to take care of us and he's going to take us through all of the things that we're going through. 
You see, but Paul is saying here that just as we suffer and we partake in the sufferings of Christ, there is rich compensation for all of these sufferings as we trust in the Lord, as we put our faith in the Lord. Good, good emerges from both our afflictions, but also from our comfort. And in Paul's case, his hope was that the believers in Corinth would be encouraged and challenged by his own patient endurance and would understand that if God could give him, the Apostle Paul, grace to suffer through the trials and difficulties, then he would give the people of the church as well the same grace through their trials and difficulties as well. Now, suffering never comes alone for the Christian. Uh, God never abandons his children to it. It always is followed by comfort. So, you may have suffering, but God promises his comfort in the midst of that. We can be confident of this. We can take that to the bank, I guess you might say. Just as Paul learned, he can take this to the bank and be confident in it. When we're suffering, we praise the Lord because we know that his comfort will follow. But Paul continues in the dialogue on this with the Corinthians. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. He's talking Asia Minor. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt as though we had received the sentence of death. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God, who raises the dead. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us again. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us as you help us by your prayers. Then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor granted us in answer to the prayers of many. So Paul bears his heart here to the people. He does not shy away from explaining that um, things didn't go easy for him in Asia Minor. Uh, Paul shows his humanity suggesting that the pressures they faced were far more than a human's normal ability to endure. It was so incredibly bad in his experience that he despaired of life itself. I, I don't know how many of us have been to that degree of suffering, but Paul says that he couldn't handle it in the normal physical way that a person would normally handle it. He, he despaired of life itself. And um, I think God permitted Paul to endure these things so that he could teach all of his uh, readers uh, of, you know, of this letter a lesson. Um, a master instructor is best suited to his position when he's worked through the worst that uh, life can throw at him in the subject he's teaching. Um, for us as listeners, sometimes it's useful to compare our sufferings to those of, of others to see how light our, our burden really is. Now, just like I was saying, consider our brothers and sisters in different places in the world, in North Korea, in China, in Iran, in, in different places in Africa, in Islamic states. Con consider how much easier it is for us and how small our problems are compared to some of the problems that they faced. I mean, our early church brothers and sisters, their children along with them, were thrown to wild beasts for standing up and taking a stand for Christ. They were set on fire and tied to the walls of Rome to act as lanterns. Um, this, this is history. Paul did not state in this letter uh, you know, that he was suffering so greatly to garner our sympathies. He did it to teach us the great lessons that he learned, that there is great strength and comfort in the Lord in the midst of it. And if it gets worse, we don't have to be afraid. We can trust in the Lord and he'll give us his comfort supernaturally to help us to endure and to be strong through whatever it is that uh, lies ahead. And sometimes I think myself when things are going wrong that um, it's my default to assume that it's because Satan has some sort of upper hand against us. Now, the truth is this, that uh, Satan does not have an upper hand against us. He only uh, can do what God permits him to do. And um, the truth is that God 
is sovereign and God uses bad things that we have to go through to help us not to rely on ourselves, but on him. God knows how our, our tendency as human beings to coast through life when it's easy. And it seems that when things go really well all of the time, the human spirit gets arrogant thinking that uh, things are going well because somehow we deserve it. We deserve the grace that we're receiving or the good things that we're receiving. I don't know about you, but if I'm really honest, you know, I've had periods of time in my life where I've felt entitled. And I think our culture is used to this. We have this sense of entitlement where I think we feel like we've earned the right somehow to be more comfortable. Where somehow, I, I, I know in myself, I've placed more, uh, more reliance on myself than I should. And uh, the things of this world can gain too much importance to us when things are always balmy and smooth sailing. And Paul recognized the danger in all this, and so should we. He also recognized the importance of, of his partnership with uh, the other believers, the Corinthian believers, in their prayers for him. Now, he acknowledges that God has purposed that the prayers of the saints were answered on his behalf. And there's a wonderful truth in the scriptures that we would do well to be reminded of and to pay attention to. Um, we were never meant to be independent souls. We are always meant to be praying for one another. Uh, riding the storms of life alone is not God's plan. My friends, when hard times come, it forces us to our knees. When things are easy, people are, tend not to pray. They tend not to push in to, to seek the Lord the way that he desires them to. But when things start to go apart, then, uh, then it pushes us to our knees. God knows this. And uh, God's put us together with other believers. We're a family of believers together because God desires us to work with him in his kingdom. And, he, and one of the ways he does this is for us to pray for one another. God answers the prayers of his people and he desires that we involve ourselves with other people's lives by, by praying for them. I want to ask you a question today. How much time do you spend in prayer? I know I uh, need to, to be more prayerful. And I, I venture to say that all of us probably could say, yeah, I, I need to turn it off and turn to the Lord and, and take it to the Lord in prayer. See, there, there's power in prayer, my friends. There's power in prayer because God has chosen this as a way that he moves. Some people say, well, if everything's preordained, you know, what's the sense of praying? God's going to have everything the way it is anyways. No, that's not the way to per perceive this. God knows that we're here together and he's calling us to involve ourselves with his kingdom purposes by praying for one another and by praying for other churches, by praying for believers in different places, by praying for our government officials, by praying for those in authority over us, by seeking the Lord and, and, and asking him to have mercy upon our country, to have mercy upon our people, to have mercy on the unsaved. Oh, there's so much prayer that uh, God calls us to, and God answers the prayers of his people. The prayers of the righteous are powerful and effective. We're righteous not because we're, you know, we've earned the right to be saints of God. We're righteous because Christ has clothed us in his righteousness. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. God has placed a robe of righteousness on you as a believer. So therefore, your prayers, when God hears your prayers, he, you're covered with the sacrificial work of Christ through his blood. You're cleansed. You're clean. There is, you can boldly approach the throne of grace. Don't ever think and don't ever listen to the lie of the enemy to say that you can't approach God um, with, with boldness. You know, God desires us not to be double-minded and to come to him with, uh, with a singularity of purpose and trust him and believe that when we pray, that he will answer our prayers. Paul's confidence is in such, and he acknowledges that it is by God's grace that he was delivered from such deadly perils that he faced. And, and he also acknowledges that in future peril, that God's grace 
will be delivered again in future circumstances. This is trusting in the Lord. See, we can't... God, God works through his people's prayers. And, and we can trust the, this, that God will comfort us uh, now in our perilous circumstance and any perilous circumstances in the future, he will comfort us, comfort us there as well. Now, we need to learn to trust him. This is true, not in ourselves. You trust yourself, you're going to be disappointed. You're not going to have, there's no power there. Trusting in our circumstances, our money, our possessions, our jobs, our, our comfort, you know, our Western comforts, and we can't put our trust there. Those can be taken away. Um, our, we could lose our houses. We could lose our possessions. Those are, those are unstable. And we can't trust that other people aren't going to make mistakes and sin against us. I mean, people are going to let us down. I'm going to let you down. You're going to let me down. We need to have our faith and trust in the Lord to take care of us. And this is where our comfort comes from. Supernaturally. It's supernatural. Our own systems fail to bring comfort, but God's systems never fail us. The Lord is always true to his word, my friends. And his plans are always used to bring about something good. He always uses our calamities to work together, everything together for the good. Those who love him and who are called according to his purposes, right? That's what the scriptures tell us. But the Corinthians, they didn't necessarily understand what Paul was saying. Um, some of them misunderstood him. Uh, some didn't realize the volume of things that he had to deal with. Now, his troubles were such that he was kept from doing some of the good things that he earnestly desired to do. And some people failed to understand this. Now, it's a tendency when people are going through troubles to be uh, introspective in thinking about themselves and their own difficulties. You kind of lick your own wound, right? Now, it's easy for us to remember, uh, you know, how we face trials and troubles and how we need comfort. And sometimes we can look to others to try and solve the problems and be the comforter. Well, yes, we're called to uh, comfort those who God has placed us with, with the comfort that God has given us. But a lot of people that are hurt, that have been through calamity, that have been through trouble, um, they turn inward and they become inward. And rather than being like Paul, who receives comfort and then disperses it, we become consumers of comfort and expecting um, people to come and dote on us and provide us comfort, but with no real expectation that God is calling us with the comfort that we receive to comfort others that are needy. So as we are, our cup is filled, we pour it out to others. This is Western consumerism Christianity, and it just does not blend. Uh, the Corinthians kind of had this problem, right? They, they were looking at Paul and they wanted him to come and minister to them and to, and to help them with all the, the, the troubles that they were facing. And Paul's trying to say, yeah, I, I, I will do this. It's my desire to do this. But the God of all comfort is what you really need. And my prayer is that I can turn you to, to look towards God for your comfort so that you in turn can comfort the other people in your life. Now, have you ever been misunderstood? You planned on doing a good thing for another person. You've told them that it was desire, your desire to do it, but were prevented from doing so by circumstances beyond your control. Well, maybe other urgent priorities needed to be addressed ahead of your desire to invest time with another person. Uh, but they didn't realize it and they thought that you were purposefully ignoring them when the, the truth of the matter is there wasn't enough hours in the day. Maybe... Uh, this has caused a rift between you and your friendships, your relationships uh, with that person um, or groups of people, actually. Uh, this is the case with Paul. So Paul continues in his letter to clarify these things. See, Paul had planted this church in Corinth. He spent about two years there from its inception, as I mentioned earlier, um, before having to leave and work in other places. Now, now, the Corinthians, selfishly, they wanted him 
to come back and minister to them and to teach them more, to help them continue to grow more. And, and, and they're very focused on their own, their own needs. And, and Paul's desire was this too. He wanted to minister to them. He wanted to help them personally. Um, and this was his plan, but it never happened as planned. You see, God had other tasks that Paul was called to, which prevented him from going back to spend time with them. And as a result, some of these Corinthian believers felt like Paul was ignoring them or that he didn't care about them and, and they developed hard feelings towards Paul because he wasn't ministering to them personally. He was writing them a letter, but, but he wasn't there to, to face to face. So Paul continues and he says this, Now this is our boast. Our conscience testifies that we have conducted ourselves in the world um, and especially in our relations with you, with integrity and godly sincerity. We have done so relying not on worldly wisdom, on, but on God's grace. For we do not write to you anything you cannot read or understand. And I hope that, as you have understood us in part, you will come to understand fully that you can boast of us, just as we will boast of you on the day of the Lord, of, Lord Jesus Christ. What is Paul trying to get at? Well, just kind of as a backdrop, like I, I just explained to you, the reason Paul qualifies himself in verses 12 to 14 was that he had formally uh, written them a fairly severe letter of rebuke. And the first letter of Corinthians was a lot of rebuking. And it was hard for the Christians in Corinth to swallow, um, but they really needed to get straight in a number of areas. And, and Paul wanted the people to understand that just because he had to address some serious issues within their rank, he was not against them, and that's not the reason why Paul couldn't come back to see them in person. Paul, Paul loved the believers in Corinth. Paul had sent Timothy back to them, and Timothy um, wasn't received well. I, they wanted Paul. Paul subsequently sent Titus to them as well, and, and uh, through that, I mean, the believers did receive Titus, and Titus reported back to Paul that um, in his severe letter to them that it had proven remarkably beneficial. But the believers in Corinth who had been the cause of so much sorrow, they, they were truly grieved by the rupturing of their relationship with Paul and they longed for him to come and, and, and be there in person with him. Um, Paul wanted them to know that they could trust that his intentions and his integrity were, were godly and, and sincere. And he advises them, um, of this because it appears as though he was a disappointment to some of the Corinthian believers. Now, leaders can sometimes disappoint us, right? Now, Paul, Paul made a plan to come and see them, but even though he wanted to minister to them in person, the Holy Spirit directed him to go elsewhere and to spend his time in other places. Paul was staying uh, in, in Macedonia, um, and he traveled from, from Ephesus to Macedonia, fully intending to stop by Corinth, but there was issues that needed to be dealt with that precluded his ability to meet in Corinth. He also said that he fully intended to visit them on his way back to Judea, but this plan was thwarted as well. It was changed because of the circumstances that were beyond Paul's control. And Paul wanted the Corinthians to see that it wasn't that he was ignoring them. This is how he explains it in verse 15. Because I was confident of this, I wanted to visit you first so that you might benefit twice. I, I wanted to visit you on my way to Macedonia and come back to you from Macedonia and to have you send me on my way to Judea. Was I fickle when I intended to do this? Or do I make my plans in a worldly manner so that in the same breath I say both yes, yes, and no, no? But as surely as God is faithful, our message to you is not yes and no. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, by me and by Silas and Timothy was not yes and no, but in him it has always been yes. For no matter how many questions God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. Now, understand this passage was written in Greek. So the translation, it, it's difficult for us to grasp this in English. That's kind of like, woo, yes and no. What are they talking? Yes, yes, no, no. What is he talking about here? Well, the meaning of these verses may be boiled down to this. The Corinthians need not think that because Paul could not visit them on his way 
to Macedonia, or is on his way from Macedonia back to Judea, on, the fact that he couldn't stop and visit with them did not mean that he was saying, yes, I'll visit you, and then being diverted somewhere else uh, because of his lack of desire to see them. No, there were circumstances beyond his control where he wanted to see them, and he said, I'm going to go come and see you, and then he was blocked from doing that due to circumstances. So therefore, um, you know, Paul had, had other ministry obligations which kept him from visiting them. Uh, his preaching was being called into question, possibly, in his teaching and his letters, because if he was saying, yes, I'll come see you, and then he doesn't come see them, is he untrustworthy? Is he untrustworthy then in his teaching? Is his teaching untrustworthy? Some of the Corinthians were struggling with this and forgetting that they weren't the only church that Paul had to work in. Um, this did not mean that the Corinthians were not important to him, but there are only so many hours in a day and many other people that he needed to minister to in other places. Now, Paul says in verse 21, Now it is God who makes both us and you stand firm in Christ. He anointed us, set his seal of ownership on us, and put his spirit in our hearts as a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. I call God as my witness and I stake my life on it, that it was in order to spare you that I did not return to Corinth. Not that we lorded over your faith, but we work with you for your joy, because it is by faith that you stand firm. So what Paul's saying is, I couldn't meet you in person, but God purposed this so that you learn to be strong in relying on him. Just as Paul himself was learning to be strong in the suffering that he had, um, in the various facets that he had that nobody else totally understood. So um, this is a great message of encouragement. We can be encouraged to know that the God of all comfort is with us. He stands with us. He'll be with us to the very end of the age. You can take that to the bank. When your suffering comes, the corresponding comfort of the Lord will also be there. So turn your eyes on the Lord. Turn your eyes away from the troubles that you face and praise him and thank him for his goodness and his mercy. And the strength and comfort of the Holy Spirit will flood over you and will empower you and give you strength to carry on, and not just to carry on, but to minister to others who are going through difficulties so you can comfort them with the comfort that you have received from the Lord. God bless you. I'm grateful to be able to uh, start this book in 2 Corinthians. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you that you provide us with comfort. Lord, you said that in this world we will have troubles, but not to be afraid because you have overcome the world. Lord, for those that are out there, they're feeling the, uh, they're feeling the trials of life, whether it's physically with sickness or illness, whether it's emotionally, uh, maybe, may, maybe there's relational issues in families that are having difficulties. God, you see all the troubles. Maybe it's persecution, Lord, for standing for you. I don't know, Lord, but you understand each person where they're at. I pray, Lord, that, that your comfort would be, would be very real to each person that is out there today. Lord, that, that they would cast their cares upon you, that I would cast my cares upon you, knowing full well that you care for us and that the corresponding struggles and, and, and suffering will, will be met with um, an equal amount of comfort from the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we thank you that you testify of Jesus and Jesus, we thank you that you came to the earth to die for our sins, to make a way so that we could be at one with the Father. And we praise you for this day, and I pray your blessing upon each person that's listening. In Jesus' name, amen.